Oh, All right. So here we go. Um, hypothermia is just a nice, polite way of saying freeze to death. Um, we're going to try to prevent that this weekend and hopefully for the rest of your days. If you can get rid of the two major risks in most people's illiteracy, hypothermia or exposure-related injuries and dehydration, then you just have to worry about hygiene. And I'll say that again because that's a really important comment on how far removed we've become from the natural landscape. If you can become aware of and avoid as part of your routine outdoors hypothermia or exposure and dehydration, a far distant third hygiene is your next biggest threat to your health and well-being. Isn't that crazy? If you watch those reality survival shows, you probably don't believe me because you're certain you're going to have to wring out the moisture from elephant poop in order to live. And that's wrong. That is completely off. <laughs> that's not even, I'm just going to talk about it. That's not yeah. going to make sense. All right. So let's start with the two biggest threats, especially in winter survival. Hypothermia is number one. When we get to water tomorrow, you actually lose more moisture in the cold than you do in the hot. We just feel it because it's hot and sticky, but it leaves us more quickly, which is why we have trapped lips. It's really dry. Our bodies are drying out quicker in winter. So we're going to get into, you know, uh, techniques to monitor oneself for and to address dehydration uh, later on. <coughs> Let's start with conduction. Conduction is the act of sitting down on a rock and feeling bad for ourselves because we're lost, and then we freeze to death because the rock is literally actively sucking our core temperature away from us. Anything that is more dense than you is going to take away your core temperature if it's colder than you. That's just how physics is. All right. So having the choice between standing on ice or standing on snow, choose snow. Having the choice between packed snow and boughs, choose boughs always create a more porous space between you and the hard earth or the hard ice. Direct contact with the ground usually means certain death in the winter. You have to find ways to lay yourself off of that ground in order to survive. So when we start building shelters tomorrow, I'm not going to give you the blueprints for an arctic lean-to, but I am going to give you concepts that are going to help to prevent conduction or convection. This morning, negative three and it was windy. Convection is huge, huge. The wind blowing, your, how many of you went out this morning and you felt almost like pain on the surface of your exposed flesh, right? That's like blowing out a candle except for it's your life spark. And it doesn't take long. On a windy day without protection, you will lose your core temperature quickly, all right? It doesn't have to be in, uh, in the air. It could also be in the water. You know, scuba diving in Guam where the water temperature was 78 degrees year-round, if there was a current, you felt it. It felt colder, even with a wetsuit on. Right? So conduction and convection are powerful, powerful tools that will rob us of our body heat. When you design your shelter, how, to, how do I protect myself against the wind? What types of barriers, baffles, sheets of plastic, lots of boughs, snow. How can I utilize the refrigerator boxes? Can I use to protect myself from my body heat being drawn from something more dense, conduction, or blown away from me through the wind, convection? Radiation is, again, physics. Anything that is generating heat in its surrounding environment is going to radiate it in all directions. Now, in middle school level science, we said heat rises. Really, it doesn't. Heat expands in all directions out and away from us, and then away from the Earth, towards the absolute zero of space. How do we keep that heat close to us so that we're not freezing to death? That nice marmot down coat is creating dead air space, right? Is it down or is it synthetic? It's down. It's down. Um, creates a dead air space so that our body heat gets radiated to and traps in that coat. Anyone here ever turn the pillow over to the cool side? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? It's that radiant heat from our body leaving that keeps us warm with our magic blankie and our nice fluffy pillow. We snuggle all in like a bunny and, you know. What natural materials out there can we use to create that dead air space? And what does that mean for the inside of our shelter? 
How can we increase our efficiency with regard to what is leaving in the way of the calories that we've ingested to generate heat? See, now you're starting to get more feral. In that culture out there, we are rich in calories and poor in nutrients. But in the real and natural world, it's a rich in nutrient, poor in calorie existence. Be mindful of every calorie that you burn. You want to keep that warm air around you. These types of spaces that we've patterned on all our lives are very inefficient. Look at the shelters of our ancestors. They were small and tight. You know, those teepees housed multiple people, not just one person. Yet look at our bedrooms in today's world and how much fuel it takes to keep them warm. If you're gathering that yourself, guaranteed you don't want a big house to heat. You're going to be too busy gathering food to eat or get water. You won't make it. Perspiration and evaporation. These are internal functions that we can actually control. The goal in all of your endeavors outside, aside from being connected and having fun, is to remain comfortably cool and dry. And that's worth repeating so you can put it in your notes. Remain comfortably cool and dry. That should be your homeostasis. So, if I'm humping a 300 cubic inch backpack, you know, in hard shell boots from point A to point B, 20 miles in less than four and a half hours, and I'm being dragged along with my Winnebago on my back, I'm going to be generating some heat. So you got the pit zips, and you've got all the fancy shell outerwear, and you hang it up on top, and you, you strip down to your shorts. But once you get to camp, especially if the sun's setting and there's no clouds in the sky, you best be ready to put those layers on. But first, any perspiration, you allow it to evaporate out. You let that those waves of heat that you can see coming off of you take that moisture until you're dry, and then you put those layers on. You don't want to trap that moisture inside. Cold, wet, and clammy is not a good way to enter the night. Again, especially in winter. And the last one is respiration. A simple trick. Keep your mouth shut. Breathe through your nose. You have a warming chamber in your sinus cavity. So you warm your air before it goes in and exchanges with your, your blood. In severe conditions, other cultures, they had a hood that extended out here. Now you have another warming area right here in your parka. So it warm, pre-warms before it gets into your sinuses, into your lungs. The entire time, keep your mouth closed. Have your gloves, one pair on your hands, underneath your mittens, your over mitts, one pair right here, so the fingers are near your femoral arteries and the, and the edges are just outside your pants, right? And a pair of socks too. So if your feet or your hands get cold, you switch to the warm pair and put the cold pair in. Right? You always have a nice warm pair of gloves to go to and keep your hands warm. A hat if your feet are cold, right? All the capillaries in your skull. So we're managing the way our, when our capillaries start to cool down our blood, we're managing how to keep that warm, more efficient. Everything is about efficiency. Materials, you've all heard of dressing layers, and I'm sure you've gotten the whole wicking layer, insulation layer, shell, right? But what materials are you using? Silk is great. It's kind of expensive. It doesn't last as long as poly, but poly kind of gets stinky after a while and gets brittle when you over dry it. Right? So for wicking layers, you know, you've got to you got to find out what works best for you. I like that new merino wool stuff now they have out that you can use as an undergarment as a wicking layer. Wool is my down, hands down favorite fabric ever. It could be used as your wicking layer your insulation layer, and if tight enough weave, your shell. And if you don't have a tight weave, just get it bulky. Yeah, you may weigh 300 pounds in sopping wet rain, but you're still going to be warm because of the lavender oils in the wool. Right? Well, and it's quiet, and it fuzzes your outline so you blend in, and you can get it in earth tones. And There's just so many reasons to like wool, but for some reason, for some reason I don't know, I think sheep are becoming an endangered species because it's getting harder and harder to find wool. Even at Goodwill, when it used to be really plentiful and cheap. I said cheap, not sheep. <laughs> Okay. So these are the these are the actions that the major mechanical actions that contribute to us freezing to death. Tomorrow morning, the first thing we're going to do before we go out and make shelters is I'm going to address these modern solutions, primitive solutions, and as teams you're going to create hybrid solutions. And I'm not going to lie, tomorrow's going to be a challenge. Tomorrow's going to be a stark in your face, holy crap, we would die if this were real situation. Rain into snow with the materials that we have and the time that we have to use them.
Does that make sense to you? Is there any questions on this so far? All right, so this is step one in a multiple step um, approach to understanding shelter construction and design for survival. All right, and then beyond survival, comfort. And in every situation, survival or not, the goal is comfort. That way if you fall short a little bit, you're still going to make it through to the next day. Good?